the topic for today's discussion is the anatomy of the brachial plexus as well as its clinical importance so here we will see the objectives of today's lecture the brachial plexus are the somatic fibers which are mainly formed by the ventral rami of c5 to t1 and if you see the position as well as the clinical anatomy of the brachial plexus these plexus these plexus artery traverse the posterior triangle of the neck and the interscalene triangle so the interscalene triangle is mainly formed by the first rib scalenus anterior and also scalenus medius so scalenus anticus syndrome is a neurologic or the vascular impairment of the upper limb mainly due to the narrowing of the interscalene triangle and there will be a subsequent compression of the brachial plexus as well as the subclavian artery so here the brachial plexus and the subclavian vessels are protected from the sharp ends of the fractured clavicle by the subclavius and we all know that the clavicle is one of the most frequently fractured bone in the body and if you talk about the subclavius muscle which is the muscle mainly innervated by the nerve to the subclavius which branches from the superior trunk of the brachial plexus so use the mnemonic for this the real texans drink cold beer to remember the proximal to the distal organization of the brachial plexus like roots trunks divisions cords as well as branches so we have totally five roots arises from the ventral ramus of c5 c6 c7 c8 and t1 and we have totally three trunks that is superior trunk middle trunk and the lower trunk and totally we have six divisions an anterior and posterior division from each of the trunks and totally we have three cords named according to the anatomical relationship with the second part of the axillary artery posterior cord which gives off axillary as well as radial nerve lateral cord which gives off musculocutaneous nerve and also the part of median nerve and the medial cord uh, which mainly gives off uh, ulnar nerve and also a part of median nerve and we have totally five terminal branches axillary radial musculocutaneous median and ulnar nerves are the chief five terminal nerves which are arising from these brachial plexus and the first one is herb's palsy which is also called as waiter's tip hand it is mainly due to lesion of the upper trunk of the brachial plexus that is c5 and c6 at the herb's point injury to the root c5 and c6 mainly affects the muscles deltoid rotator cuff muscles elbow flexors wrist as well as hand extensors and here the latissimus dorsi is mainly innervated by the middle subscapular that is also called as the thoracodorsal nerve which is mostly derived from c4 therefore it is not affected in herb's palsy so because of the deltoid as well as rotator cuff muscles are paralyzed due to the injury of c5 and c6 the action of the latissimus dorsi on the shoulder that is extension abduction and the medial rotation is unopposed therefore arm hangs by side that is adduction and internally rotated that is also called as medially rotated so next is the clumkey's palsy lesion to the lower trunk of the brachial plexus that is c8 and t1 causes clumkey's palsy which mainly affect uh, wrist uh, flexors as well as intrinsic muscles of the hand that is thenar as well as hypothenar muscles and volar and dorsal intrachiae and also lumbricals so mainly over here injury of c8 and t1 may also involve the sympathetic trunk or ganglia which leads to the development of horner syndrome with the main important characteristic features of ptosis meiosis and anhydrosis and the next one is the winging of scapula winging of scapula is mainly because of injury to the long thoracic nerve it is also called a nerve to the serratus anterior because it is innervating that muscle so the serratus anterior is innervated by the long thoracic nerve mainly formed by the ventral rami of the spinal nerve c5 c6 and c7 and the actions of the serratus anterior if you see it's mainly responsible for upward rotation of the scapula and here the serratus anterior is responsible for the shoulder abduction above the horizontal plane that is the reason we will call it as overhead abduction of the arm is lost whenever there is a long thoracic nerve injury and uh, protraction and depression of the scapula is also done by this uh, nerve the lesion of the long thoracic nerve is more commonly seen during mastectomy whenever you are removing the axillary lymph nodes the most common nerve to be damaged is the long thoracic nerve 
which leads to the paralysis of serratus anterior and mainly the abduction of the arm is not possible beyond 45 degrees because beyond 45 degrees for the abduction of the arm you need serratus anterior along with the deltoid even though the deltoid is normal the power is not enough to lift the hand above 45 degrees there's a reason we can say that above 45 degrees abduction is not possible during long thoracic nerve injury so there's a reason i say that inability to raise the arm above 45 degrees and uh, impossible to raise the arm beyond 90 degrees and mainly there will be a medial winging of scapula where inferior angle is rotated medially and lifted superiorly and away from the posterior thoracic wall which may be accentuated by having the patient push against the wall with the flat palms right so if you compare the lesion of the accessory nerve that is cranial nerve 11 mainly uh, the best example for this is a radical neck dissection it leads to the paralysis of trapezius which leads to drooping of the shoulder and also the lateral scapular winging medial scapular winging is mainly associated with the long thoracic nerve and the lateral scapular winging the characteristic feature mainly what we will see here is inferior scapular angle is rotated laterally and shifted superiorly and away from the posterior thoracic wall which may be accentuated during resisted abduction this is what you need to know about uh, the brachial plexus as a quick review along with the clinical importance